Hey, how's it going guys? This is going to be a video on the continuation of polar and nonpolar covalent bonds, and then we'll finish off in a discussion about ionic bonds. Let's go further into how electronegativity affects covalent bonding. A simple example would be a single water molecule, dubbed as H2O. Compared to a molecule of oxygen, O2, it's pretty obvious that the shape and structure we see here in water is vastly different. You can see here that the structure of water consists of one oxygen connected to two different hydrogen atoms by sharing four available valence electrons. What's not so obvious is that oxygen is pulling and holding on to those shared electrons much more than either of the two hydrogens. We went over a concept on why this is so and how you can determine in what direction electrons gravitate to in covalent bonds in the last video titled Valence Electrons on Polar and Nonpolar Covalent Bonds. Check it out. It's really good to understand the basic fundamental stuff as we move on to more complicated concepts. Anyways, what makes a shared electron gravitate more to oxygen than hydrogen? Well, that's because oxygen is much, much more electronegative than hydrogen. If there is an uneven sharing of electrons between atoms in a covalent bond, we refer to this as a polar covalent bond. It's really important that you know the differences between polar and nonpolar. Here's what you need to understand. As a consequence of oxygen taking more of the electrons shared between itself and hydrogen, hydrogen is finding itself with less of a grip on its own negatively charged electron. This would mean that in this polar, unevenly shared bond, hydrogen is slightly more positive or slightly less negative due to its remaining proton. And oxygen, with its electronegative dominance, has now a slightly more negative charge overall. Scientists have symbolized a partial negative and partial positive charge with the symbols delta minus and delta plus, respectively. So that's about it, yep. That's all you need to know about covalent bonding for now. Let's move on to another type of bonding called ionic bonding. Ionic bonds have a very similar concept to covalent bonds, but instead of sharing electrons, ionic bonding actually completely takes away an electron from the other. This isn't a full-on one-sided advantage for only one of its atoms in the molecule. It's often more times than not a mutual agreement between the two. One atom is in desperate need of an extra electron to fill out its outer shell, while the other is in desperate need of getting rid of its extra electron. Let's look at an example of table salt. Table salt is made up of sodium and chloride molecules. Sodium, represented as Na, for example, has an atomic number of 11 protons, meaning it has 11 electrons orbiting its outer shells. Take into account Hund's rule as explained in the previous video titled shells, subshells, and orbitals, sodium ends up with a valence number of one, meaning that there's one unpaired electron in its outermost shell just waiting to break out. Now the reason for this particular electron wanting to leave its home is rather how it is structured and explained in the previous video I just mentioned earlier, link in the description below. If the electron does succeed in leaving the sodium atom, it will result in the sodium having a net fully positive charge due to now having more protons than electrons. We call this newly charged atom an ion and is denoted as Na+. More specifically, since it's positively charged, we call it a cation. Now chlorine atoms are in dire need of an electron to fill its outer shell. If it succeeds in doing so, it's left with an extra electron, meaning its overall net charge is now a negative one. Again, we call this newly charged atom an ion, but more specifically, since it's a negatively charged ion, we'll call it an anion. 
written as Cl-. Its name has slightly changed as well, from chlorine to chloride. Together as table salt, the negatively charged anion and the positively charged cation are strongly attracted to each other, forming an ionic bond. So to summarize this all together, nonpolar covalent bonds usually have atoms that have no charge. Polar covalent bonds move up a bit and have partially charged properties. And finally, ionic bonds are when atoms are fully charged. I hope you've learned a lot from this video. In the next video, we're going to talk about the actual formations and structures of molecules that form the basis of life. Again, remember to hit the like button, subscribe, and share with all your friends. See you again soon. Bye.